Okay, so I research philosophy, and the area I mainly focus on is metaphysics. Now, when you tell someone that you research physics or history, they at least have some idea of what you do. After all, people do physics and history in school, but we tend not to teach philosophy in school, so people are a bit less clear about it. And as for metaphysics, well, when it comes to metaphysics, people either have no idea, or worse, they think they have an idea of what metaphysics is. Um, for instance, I once went on a date with someone, and she was falling over herself to tell me uh, how she was also into metaphysics, and how she loved crystal gazing and out-of-body experiences. <laughs> uh, and needless to say, that is not what metaphysics is about. Needless to say, there was, there was no second date. So, what is metaphysics exactly? Well, I'm not sure that there's any good answer to that. Not that this is too surprising. If I asked you to define physics or history, I think you'd find it very difficult to give a definition. So, we'll probably stick with just an imperfect definition of metaphysics. That'll do for the purpose of this lecture. So, I say that metaphysics is the discipline of charting what's possible and what's impossible. The difference between what could happen and what could not happen. But when we say possible, we have to be very careful, because we might mean many different things by the word possible. Crucially for defining what we mean by metaphysics, I'm going to distinguish between two types of possibility. Logical possibility and physical possibility. So consider that first type. To ask whether something is physically possible is to ask whether it's consistent with the laws of physics. For instance, that you might not have turned up here today at this lecture is consistent with the laws of physics. It's not as if you would have had to have conducted a miracle akin to walking on water to stay at home and not come here. Equally, that there might be world peace might be in some sense outlandish. You might say that it's impossible. But you don't mean by that that it's physically impossible. It's not the laws of physics which get in the way of world peace. It's greed, it's avarice. Avarice. It's our inability to work together in times of economic, of economic difficulties. What gets in the way of world peace is not the speed of light, or the fact that electrons are negatively charged, or that oxygen is combustible. World peace is physically possible, even if it is, in some sense, impossible. So that's what I mean by physical possibility. And we can compare physical possibility to the second type of possibility, logical possibility. Logical possibility, you might think, is broader than physical possibility. Take, take Harry Potter. So it's a, story of, it's a story of wizards and magic. And the laws of nature are clearly broken in Harry Potter. It's clearly physically impossible, the story of Harry Potter. But in some other sense, it is possible. It's not inherently contradictory that Harry Potter might exist. You can't figure it out from the armchair, is one of the phrases I will use. You can't figure it out from the armchair that there's no such thing as magic, that there's no such things as, as wizards and witches. To discover that there's no such place as Hogwarts, you have to go out and look at the world. You have to go and do some empirical investigation. You have to go and do some science to discover that magic is impossible. Or consider another one of my research interests, the flat earth conspiracy theory. So I've... I've met and talked with flat earthers. I was invited to London to speak to a, a group of globe skeptics. This was, this was before COVID, this was before QAnon, this was before things started getting uh, ever more aggressive and violent when it came to conspiracy theories. So I'm not sure if I'd do that sort of thing anymore. But at the time, it was, it was an insightful and enjoyable experience and I hope everyone who intended it got a lot out of it. But I guess, I guess that's another story. So I've heard and read a lot about flat earth theory. And they believe that we actually live in a dome designed by God. That there's no such thing as outer space, that there's no such thing as gravity. Now I think that's false, but I don't think it's contradictory. I don't think it's prima facie inconsistent, such that we could just rule it out without having to do some science and investigating the nature of the world. Magic and flat earth are logical possibilities, even though Having learned about science, we've come to know that they're not physical possibilities. And not everything is logically possible. Not everything is logically possible. Some things aren't. The idea that 2 plus 2 equals 5, for instance, is logically impossible. 
It's something that I can figure out is false without having to do any experiments, without having to uh, look at the nature of the world. Or consider another conspiracy theory. I love my conspiracy theories. There's so many out there. Uh, consider the conspiracy theory of sovereign citizenship. So they believe that they have all sorts of legal rights that you otherwise don't think that they have. For instance, they think they're not obliged to pay taxes. They think that they don't legally have to have a driver's license if they're driving. And they believe all of this, despite also believing that lawyers and police officers and judges and the rest of the nation at large do think that these things are illegal. This conspiracy theory is a lot unlike, is, is quite unlike flat earth theory. The flat earthers believe something that is at least logically possible. It at least makes some coherent sense in some sense. But sovereign citizens, they believe something logically impossible. What determines what is legal or illegal just is how we behave as a society and how our judges act, what our police officers arrest you for, and so on. And it just makes no sense whatsoever to believe that there's a secret hidden legal code that only you can discern. The legal code of a nation is, in some sense, necessarily public insured. So these sovereign citizens, they don't just believe something that's, fit, that's, that's false, they believe something that's logically impossible in a way that the flat earthers don't. So hopefully that's a, a, a brief introduction to the two types of possibility. And with those in place, we can go back to defining metaphysics. So metaphysics is the study of whether something is logically possible. Obviously, it's not the study of what is physically possible. For the, that's for the scientists. That's not for someone like me to tell you about. What philosophy can do, what metaphysics can do, is chart the difference between what is logically impossible and what isn't. Metaphysicians, we deal with problems, uh, with questions like, is it possible for us to have free will? Is it possible for us to want to be in a fetus? And as we shall see, is it possible to travel back in time or not? So that's what metaphysics is. That's, that's broadly speaking what metaphysics is. And it splits into many different sub-disciplines. I started researching my career in areas called meliology and ontology. I was looking at questions of under what circumstances small parts came to compose larger wholes. But while citing my PhD at the University of Leeds, myself and some other postgraduates, uh, George Darby, Duncan Watson, Alex Buckley amongst others, we decided to start a time travel leading group. I'd always been interested in time travel. Just ask my family and they'll tell you that that's the case. And there was enough philosophical literature out there for us to be able to build up a, a leading list for us to work through in the leading group. At the start, it was mainly just for the sake of interest, but it quickly turned into something else. Jonathan Lobson, who's now at Nottingham, he had a fascinating scenario involving what would happen if we took a brick back in time many, many times over and over and built a wall out of it. I thought that this scenario had implications for the sort of research that I was already doing. So the two of us worked on a paper together. Along with spades of invaluable help from my Tyler supervisor, Joe Melia, uh, it became one of my first published papers. And this started my journey of researching specifically on time travel. Unsurprisingly, the big question in the philosophy of time travel dovetails neatly with this idea of metaphysics as trying to chart the difference between what is logically possible and what is impossible. For philosophers, the central question is, uh, in the philosophy of time travel is whether time travel is logically possible. And we can compare this to the central question for physicists on the topic, which is whether time travel is physically possible. Whilst its physical possibility is of interest to physicists more than philosophers, it would be neglectful for me to not at least first say something about its physical possibility so we can be sure that what I'm discussing in this lecture isn't this, as whimsical as discussing what would happen if fairy tales were true. When we look at the scientific literature, we see that the jury is out. Scientists are certainly not agreed that time travel is physically impossible. Papers are written in esteemed physics journals on how you might set about traveling back in time. And in that literature, if we look at that literature, there's two main ways in which that would be brought about. The first way is via wormholes, or otherwise warping space-time to allow us to travel back into the past. 
You would need an object that was of sufficient mass and density, such as a black hole, or an object rotating exceedingly fast, such that it twists space-time into the required shape. And you may have even seen examples of these sorts of things in films like Interstellar, where there's a portal into another part of the universe, or indeed a portal into the past. If such wormholes and warpings are possible, they're certainly hard to bring about. These are not the sorts of things that you could make inside a laboratory. Speculative suggestions is how you would make one invariably involve stellar scale projects, such as lining up multiple neutron stars in a row and rotating them very fast. Such outlandish ideas might seem ridiculous, but it's not out of the question that at some future time, perhaps some far distant future time, we might be able to achieve this kind of feat. The second method by which scientists think you might be able to travel back in time is via tachyons. Now, you may have learned that physics precludes objects traveling faster than the speed of light. But that, if they did, then they would go back in time. But actually, physics only says that the latter thing is true. Objects can go faster than the speed of light. It's just that such objects, what are called tachyons, would have to never slow down below the speed of light. There would be these weird things that always traveled faster than the speed of light and were always traveling back in time. Now, whilst that means that you couldn't travel back in time because you can't go faster than the speed of light, if tachyons existed, you might be able to capture them or interact with them or manipulate them to send signals back into the past, which, for all intents and purposes, is exactly the same as time travel. Now, we've gone looking for tachyons. We've speculated about the ways in which they might be produced, the places in which we might try and find them. And all of those experiments that have gone looking for them have turned up absolutely nothing. So you might think nature does not allow for tachyons, although by the end of this lecture, I'll have explained to you why I think this is the long lesson to draw from this. But this is something that we'll return to. For now, let's go back to the perennial question that philosophers are interested in when it comes to time travel. Is time travel logically possible? And usually, this question is couched in terms of the grandfather paradox. Here's how it goes. If you had a time machine, you could get in it, and you could travel back in time to before you, your grandfather met your grandmother. And there, you could kill your grandfather. And isn't that, isn't that impossible? If you killed your grandfather in 1930, or, or whenever, uh, before he even met your grandmother, how would you be born? So if you had a time machine, you'd be capable of doing the impossible. Since you can't do the impossible, it follows that you can't have a time machine. So the argument goes, we've proved without lifting a finger, without conducting a single scientific experiment, that time machines and time travel are impossible. Uh, the example of grandfather murder, by the way, is purely for example purposes. My parents, when they learned what I researched, would sometimes despair, but Nick, what do you have against your grandfather, they would ask. <laughs> so you can switch it for something more innocuous. For instance, can you go back in time to turn off the oven that you left on last week? That would be just as impossible as killing your grandfather. But ever since time travel stories got popular at the start of the 20th century, the stock example has always been one of grandfather murder. So I'm going to stick with it here. So the, the grandfather I'm killing in this thought experiment is, is not then my real, either of my real grandfathers. Uh, both of whom I loved, and I'm sure would be proud to see me here. So, the grandfather paradox. You have three options when facing the grandfather paradox. The first is that the thought experiment proves exactly what it appears to, the time travel is impossible. The second and third options both allow for time travel. The second option allows that time travel is possible, and that I could assassinate my grandfather in 1930. The third option allows that time travel is possible but that I cannot assassinate him, that I'm unable to change the past, that something has gone wrong by even suggesting that I might successfully do this and might successfully uh, assassinate him in the past. So let's uh, examine those options in turn. So you might leap, uh, you might love the idea that time travel is impossible, but that's exactly what I think it is. And usually those who take this option in earnest uh, pearl it with some measure of disdain at even asking the question in the first place. Philosophy, or at least thinking about time travel, is simply pointless, they say. 
It's a game rather than a discipline. But these two sentiments are at odds with one another. If the grandfather paradox shows that time travel is impossible, it shows just how useful philosophy is. For then we would have it, a philosophical thought experiment, something that you can think about without leaving your armchair, and it would prove that time travel was impossible. It would prove that all of those physicists were wasting their time. It would prove that all of those articles written in Physical Review D and the other esteemed physics journals were just a complete waste of ink. On this view, philosophy allows us to turn up and just tell those physicists that they were wasting their time. Now, maybe this is the lesson to be learned, though I doubt it. I'm far more deferential to science than that. I admit that sometimes thought experiments can prove interesting things. The, the best example is Galileo's thought experiment that things accelerate towards the Earth at the same rate, no matter their mass. But I don't think this thought experiment is like that. I don't think this thought experiment proves something that useful. I say, if you want to know whether time travel, whether a physicist is right about whether time travel is possible or not, go and do some science. That's what you've got to go and do. Sitting in your armchair doing thought experiments is not, I think, going to tell you the answer. Defer to physics. Don't dictate to it. So philosophy is useful and interesting, but I don't think it's so useful and so interesting that it could, as we would need for this option to be true, tell us about the impossibility of time travel. That, at least, is how I see things. So with that in place, we have to consider one of the, the remaining two options. Now, those, those who have read uh, enough science fiction, you will maybe think that we can change the past. In fiction, we find people often talking about things like multiverses. So take Marvel's latest blockbuster movies, where the superheroes fly through history, changing the past to their heart's content. And they do this by arriving at new universes where they change the past in these new universes, leaving the one that they left all fine and dandy. Now, this idea that there's other universes, that time travel involves going to them, does admittedly has, have some proponents amongst the physics community. But my time here is limited, so I'm not going to discuss that option. Rather, I'm going to talk about the option that most philosophers focus on. And on this orthodox view, there's no other universes. Rather, time travel is possible, but when you go into the past, you can't change anything. So if I go back in time to kill my grandfather in my time machine, we know I will fail. No matter what we do, things will go badly, and I'll be left with a hale and healthy grandfather at the end of it all. For instance, when I go to the past, I might change my mind about killing him. Or I might get stuck in a traffic jam on the way to the intended murder scene. Or my gun might jam. Or I might shoot someone, but it turns out to be the wrong person. Or, as I'm about to fire, I might have a heart attack. Whatever. The idea is that something would stop me. Something would get in the way each time, every time. I can go back to the past, but I can't change the past on this option. And it's this theory, what is sometimes called the Ludovician theory of time travel, that I'll assume is true for the rest of the talk. And it's the option that is most philosophically interesting. Here's one thing that's interesting philosophically about this option. What explains my failure? You might think that if every time I try to kill my grandfather, then I fail, then there must be some sort of explanation for that failure. When we talk about explanations, it's natural to think that the answer is one of two types. Perhaps, first of all, some sort of agent is responsible for my failure. Some person. Perhaps God sets it up to stop me every time. Perhaps there's some sort of time police made up of people who look exactly like Hollywood actors who spend their time foiling my attempts. The other way of thinking about explanation is to think about, of it in terms of natural explanation, that there's some law of nature that prevents me from changing the past, that the laws of physics will stay my hand as I try and commit murder. But we should not think that either of these things are true. Neither of these explanations are good explanations. I do believe there's an explanation for why I fail each and every time to kill my grandfather, but that explanation is not an explanation in terms of agents, nor is it an explanation in terms of the law of nature. Rather, 
It is a purely logical explanation. Now, to see what a, a purely logical explanation is, consider the following example. Yeah, imagine I gave you 10 small squares and asked you to build a bigger square out of them. Could you do it? Well, the answer, of course, is you cannot. You can make a big square out of nine small squares by making three those of three, but you can't make it with 10 small squares. You'll never be able to make a bigger square shape out of them. It's impossible. And every time you attempt to do it, you will fail. But your failure, it isn't explained by some sort of agent getting in your way. It's not as if your next door neighbor or your childhood bully or Rishi Sunak is stopping you from making the bigger square. Nor is there a law of nature that's, that's preventing you from succeeding. It's not as if, if only the squares were negatively charged or made of a suitable metal or heated to 100 degrees Celsius, then you'd be able to make the bigger square. Now, the, the explanation is one of logic. It's mathematical. Making the bigger square out of 10 small squares is logically impossible. And this in itself explains your failures. This in itself explains, explains your inability to do it. And I think exactly the same thing is going on with time travel. Because it's logically impossible for me to kill my grandfather, that is what explains why I keep failing to kill him, why I get caught in traffic jams, why I have a heart attack, and so on. The explanation is just purely logical. OK, so this is all well and good. Now, I'm sure some people who have attended this talk today already know these things. All of these ideas appear in fiction. All of these idea, uh, ideas appear in most decent pop science books. And you came here to hear about the dangers of time travel. How is anything I've said here dangerous, exactly? Well, in my book, Time Travel, Probability and Impossibility, the Chewis's plug, the Chewis's plug, um, I, argue, I argue that when we take this theory of time travel seriously, which I think we most definitely should, then weird things start to go on with probability. Weird things start to go on with the decisions you make in time travel cases. And I'll walk you through that step by step. So first, let's consider how merging my grandfather would be of danger to me, the would-be assassin. So assume, for the sake of simplicity, that I go back in time to kill my grandfather. And that one of two things will happen to stop me. Either my gun will jam, even though I cleaned it as soon as I got back into the past, or uh, I'll have a heart attack, even though le my last health checkup came back perfectly clean. I was in the peak of health. So obviously, this is a slightly fantastical thought experiment. Now, in normal circumstances, in circumstances where I don't time travel, if I picked a gun and tried to shoot some random person, then my gun, gun malfunctioning would be highly unlikely. My having a heart attack would be highly unlikely as well. And if we assume that only one of those two ways was the way for me to fail, then my chance of succeeding in killing someone would be highly likely. That's what happens in a normal circumstance. But a time travel case is not so normal. We've assumed not only that if I fail, that one of these two things must come about, but that I most definitely will fail. We know that I cannot change the past. We know that my attempt to kill my grandfather will be unsuccessful. We know that I am destined to suffer either a gun misfiring or a heart attack. So whilst in normal circumstances, either of these things is very unlikely, in a time travel case where I'm trying to kill my grandfather, it is certain that one of these things will happen. So the chance of either of them happening must go up. It must skyrocket. If I try and kill my grandfather, for some reason, the chance of my gun misfiring will rise. Equally, if I try to kill my grandfather, for some reason, a logical reason, like the reason why it's impossible to make a bigger square, the chance of my having a heart attack also becomes very likely indeed. So that's, that's how we get to the dangers of time travel. If I don't travel in time, and I just try and shoot random people, my chance of having a heart attack is low. But if I travel back in time and try and kill my grandfather, my chance of having a heart attack rockets up. Time travel, or at least this specific case of time travel, is very bad for my health. But I've also promised you more than that, significantly more. 
This talk is about how time travel is dangerous like now. That like now we're facing dangers that we should be accounting for and that we should be concerning ourselves with. All I've shown here is in this specific time travel scenario. Um, one where I've, it, it, with two features. First of all, that I've managed to go back in time and that I'm doing something quite radical, like killing my grandfather, I've only shown that a scenario like that is dangerous. But time travel is weird. And the weirdness of time travel means that these two elements turn out to be irrelevant to these kinds of dangers. So consider the first element. When I'm killing my grandfather, I had it that the time travel was dangerous only once I got into the time machine and returned to the past. And that's significantly different from the situation we find ourselves in in this lecture theatre. Currently, we don't have any time machines. And even our speculative theories about how to go to the past, how to make a time machine, they seem to indicate that creating a time machine is many, many years off. Not decades, but millennia at the very least. So that our descendants in the year 1 million AD, they may face this problem. I guess it's interesting enough that our descendants in 1 million AD might have gun misfires and increased chances of heart attack. But what relevance is it to us? What relevance is it to our situation? Because we haven't gone back in time. Well, to see why it's relevant, note that the thing that stops me changing the past, such as a heart attack, it needn't take place after I've gone back into the past. For now, keep imagining a case where I do have a time machine, where I do own one. And imagine that I'm in the present day, and I'm about to use it to go into the past. I'm like, ooh, I'm going I'm to use that now. I'm going to go back and kill my grandfather. Well, we're agreed that my chance of having a heart attack is very high, that my chance of having a heart attack has, has gone up. But that heart attack, it might strike before I get in the time machine. That heart attack would then be just as effective in stopping me from killing my grandfather uh, than if I had the heart attack after I used the time machine. It makes no difference either way. I've heart attack before, heart attack after. Either of them will stop me committing murder. And that's a bit weird. It's weird that if I just sit there and think about using a time machine, that this alone raises the chances of me dying. Now, I think this is weird, but I think that this is true. It's weird because you're thinking that the kinds of things that raise the chance of a heart attack are usually some kind of physical mechanism. Eating high cholesterol food, for instance, increases the chance of a heart attack. There's a physical mechanism going between bacon consumption to heart attacks. But it, in this case, the case we're merely thinking about using a time machine, there doesn't seem to be any similar sort of physical process in play. What's the etiology of my heart attack in this case? But in a time travel scenario, things don't work like that, and we've already seen why. Your eating too much bacon physically explains why you have a heart attack. But in this case, in the case of time travel, what explains those events that lead me to having a heart attack is not a physical explanation, but a logical explanation, as I've already said. So there needn't be a causal mechanism, in the same way that no causal mechanism is needed to prevent me from building the bigger square. Once you buy into this, and I think you should, it gets even weirder. We've moved from me being more likely to die once I go back in time, to be me, to me being more likely to die if I'm just sat next to a time machine thinking about going back in time. But we can go further. If I was a scientist who didn't currently have a time machine, but I was likely to build one in 2073, so 40 years later, I haven't even discovered how to build a time machine, but I'm likely to be able to build one by then. Well, then it follows that I'm more likely to die now. If I'm someone who's likely to have a grandchild who makes a time machine to come back and kill me. That is, if I'm both likely to have a grandchild who I teach physics to and then also be very mean and nasty to them, well then, right now, which might be the same thing for some people here, right now, I'm more likely to die of a heart attack, even though that grandchild doesn't even as yet exist. And we can take this to an extreme. If I'm such that my descendants in the year 1 million AD would otherwise build a time machine, and use it to change the past, then my chance of dying has gone up right now. 
All of this is very, very weird. But all of this, I think, is also true. The other element of the scenarios was that I was planning to do something quite radical, like killing my grandfather. But surely most people who go back in time, if they had a chance to go back in time, well, they love their grandfathers. They wouldn't try to kill their grandfather. They'd probably use the time machine to go back for extra hugs and additional bags of sweets and this kind of thing, rather than going back with, say, murder in mind. But it turns out that any time travel of any sort is just as bad as me trying to kill my grandfather. Any attempt to travel back into the past, no matter how apparently innocent it might appear, is as likely to have these same effects as me doing something obviously reckless, like trying to kill my grandfather. This is because it's logically impossible to make any change to the past, not just killing my grandfather back in 1930, um, but any sort of change to the past is impossible. Any sort of change to the past will raise the chances of me having a heart attack. If you left the oven on last week, you can no more turn that off than you could kill Hitler. The universe just doesn't care uh, what the nature of the contradiction is. The universe doesn't care if you're making it the case that you're both born and not born, or making it the case that the oven is both on and not on. A contradiction is a contradiction no matter what it's about. And this applies even at the smallest of levels. If a, a moat of dust on the tip of Mount Everest is in one location in 1930, then it's always got to be in that location in 1930. You can no more time travel and change its position than you could time travel and eradicate humanity from all of history. And that's where the problem comes. Because imagine I try and do something seemingly inconsequential. Imagine I go back in time not to kill my grandfather, but to the middle of the Gobi Desert, with no one around me for 100 miles. I step out my time machine for only five seconds, and then I step back in. Now, this seems to be most unlike the case of me going back in time to kill my own grandfather. I seem to have gone to pains to avoid changing. How could anything like this avoid changing the past? But whilst I was there in the Gobi Desert, my mass had a gravitational effect. It cast out gravity waves at the speed of light, slightly altering, if only by a smidgen, the location of every, every single atom that they touch on the way. Because I've appeared in the Gobi Desert, the moat of dust on the tip of Mount Everest has moved, only barely, only by an amount that perhaps God himself would notice, but it has moved. And the universe, the universe doesn't see a difference between my grandfather being both dead and alive, or a speck of dust on Mount Everest being in two different places. That piece of dust can be no more moved by me in the past and I can kill my own grandfather. Thus, if I tried to go back into the past, even if, even if it was just to step out into the Gobi Desert, then something is going to stop me. My appearing in the past for any length of time has to be prevented. Any attempt to do that will skyrocket my chance of dying. And it doesn't matter how much effort or how many precautions I take to avoid changing the past. I can, I can take notes on every episode of Doctor Who and Star Trek, and I'm still unavoidably going to change the past if I travel back at all. So logic dictates that I'm never going to survive long enough to use a time machine, no matter what I'm planning to do with it. So we've got the lesson. All time travel is deadly. And more weirdly, and far more worryingly, the deadliness of time travel might result in someone dying who has nothing to do with a time machine. You might have a heart attack now, not because you're planning to travel back and kill your grandfather, but because if you don't die, then one of, one of your descendants in the year 1 million AD would otherwise try and use their time machine to try and do it. To stop your descendants in the year 1 million AD from time traveling, the universe might swat you out of existence right now so that the descend descendant never comes into being. OK, so you might think all of this, you might think all of this is quite interesting, but again, you might think it's still irrelevant. Perhaps you think time travel is physically impossible. Or maybe you're convinced, you're convinced of what I've said, but you think, well, I can't do much to affect 
what my descendant in the year 1 million AD does. So what should I care now? Why is it relevant to me? But there are things to which this line of thinking is relevant to. So consider CERN and the Large Hadron Collider. In that, we run experiments where the particle accelerator creates conditions ever closer to the start of the Big Bang, when the greatest release of energy in the history of the universe came about. And at such high levels of energy, exotic things go on, which is exactly why we built the accelerator to do these experiments. When the accelerated beams of energetic particles collide with one another, they create conditions which reflect what the universe was like within about, about a billionth of a second of the Big Bang occurring. And we get an insight into the strange nature of reality at that point in time. And some physicists, serious physicists who have made it their business to think about these things, they have suggested that it's possible, that it's possible that we might generate conditions allowing for some kind of time travel. I don't mean by this that we might create some lip in reality that takes us back to 1066. I don't mean that the scientists will be whipped off into the past like it's the start of a Netflix show. No, what I mean is that there might be tiny microscopic wormholes, so small that it might let through only a single subatomic particle, the, the smallest of superstrings, the quickest of quarks, and that this tiny little particle might slip into the past by a microsecond or less. But even if the time travel event is small, even if it's only a single particle going back in time a split second, rather than a cast of people going back a thousand years, well, we've got a problem. Keep bearing in mind that any time travel whatsoever is dangerous, and that includes the most elusive of electrons going back in time by just an instant. So this, this is never going to happen. This is never going to happen. Anything that you do that might bring this about will ultimately be thwarted, even if that means it's something otherwise unlikely and calamitous happening. So if some experiment conducted tomorrow at CERN was to create a microscopic wormhole that allows for time travel, something is going to stop that experiment being done right now. You might think, along the lines I've just described, that the scientist doing the experiment will have a heart attack, but in all honesty, that won't stop the experiment being done. If some scientist keels over, the experiment will probably be conducted anyhow. And even if a string of accidents uh, stop the experiment being done, what would stop us from trying again and again from turning the accelerator on? Only something huge would stop the experiment being conducted, something big, something that not only stops uh, some given scientist from running some particular experiment, but something so apocalyptic, so dangerous and wide-ranging, that it stops every scientist from ever again trying to run an experiment of that form. And here, of course, I'm thinking of events like, I don't know, nuclear war, or an asteroid hitting the Earth and wiping out all life outside of the oceans. Anything along those lines will do the trick. So as the scientists are planning to turn the Large Hadron Collider on, if it's likely to bring about a time travel event of some sort, then they're raising the chances of this sort of event. It's this sort of event that becomes more likely. It's this sort of event which is playing the role of the heart attack from the simplified thought experiment. It's this sort of event which is a danger, and it's a big danger, it's a big danger. And whilst it sounds weird, the planning to turn on a particle accelerator on Wednesday might spark World War III on Tuesday, well, that, that's just how it is when you start involving time travel, or when you start involving even the possibility of time travel. Okay, so you might think, is this guy kidding me? I'm not. I'm not. I genuinely believe this. This is something I genuinely believe. That isn't to say that I genuinely believe that time travel is physically possible. I don't have that opinion. But I do believe that there's a chance that it might be, and that these worries, therefore, are important to the here and now. And indeed, if you go back to those tachyon experiments, scientists went looking for tachyons, but they never found them, which you might take as evidence, being that they aren't physically possible. But if what I've said is right, then we should never have expected to see them. You should never have expected to find them when you went looking for them. If I'm right, even if the laws of nature say that they're very likely to be there, then it will turn out that you won't find them there. 
You won't find them when you go looking for them. So we shouldn't be so sure that our failure to find evidence of the physical possibility of time travel is actually evidence for being physically impossible. If I'm right, we should advise perhaps how we're trying to figure out what the laws of nature are when it comes to this topic. Okay, so what should you do in light of this danger? What should you do in light of these fears of turning on the Large Hadron Collider? Okay, so be clear, I'm not being histrionic. I'm not, su I'm not suggesting that we close down CERN. I'm not suggesting that we ban running particle accelerator experiments. We can take account of existential sets like these without losing our heads. Consider other such dangers, such as asteroids hitting the Earth, or supervolcanoes exploding, or a coronal mass ejection wiping out electricity across the planet, or a pandemic more virulent and difficult to control than COVID. We acknowledge these dangers. We plan for these dangers. We devise, devote time and resources to devising ways to deal with them. We move forwards with at least some measure of caution with them in mind. For instance, the US invests $150 million a year into defending us against asteroids. And we almost certainly don't invest uh, enough time into spur transformers in case of a coronal mass injection. Although even there, the utility companies, the utility companies, the electricity companies, they do invest time and resources and planning into what would happen if these things took place. And all of this is achieved without upending our lives. So I'm, I'm not the academic equivalent of a Daily Mail headline. <laughs> I'm just suggesting that time travel is dangerous, but that it's not the greatest danger you should worry about. It's, we should move forward with just this one extra danger in mind. And in this case, I think the effort we need to take should hopefully be low cost. Given the nature of the threat, a mere safety check is all it's called for. And we've done things like this before. For instance, when testing nuclear bombs, before they started testing them, it occurred to someone that there was a chance that the nuclear bomb might cause a chain reaction that would cause all of the oxygen in the atmosphere across the planet to combust, wiping out all life on Earth. So, quite reasonably, some scientists were charged with figuring out exactly what that possibility was. How likely was it? And they came back and they said it was very low. Now, in retrospect, you might think that a nuclear bomb doing this is just absurd. But given what was at stake, namely the existence of all life on the planet, I think we can all agree that they were well advised to do exactly that. And what I'm calling for is just to do precisely the same when it comes to understanding the dangers of time travel. And indeed, CERN already has a safety studies group. In 2003 and 2008, it seriously considered the possible existential dangers of turning on the Large Hadron Collider and running experiments like these. So, for instance, one of the speculative worries they had was it might create things called strangelets such that when they collided with other normal matter, they would turn it into corresponding strange matter. The worry was that within a short period, maybe even within the space of a few seconds of the experiment being done, the entire Earth would be converted into an inert sphere of hyperdense matter about 100 meters across. Again, all life would die. So they checked to see whether this was a problem, and they decided it wasn't. And I think we can all agree that they were best advised to do that before they turned it on. So my recommendation is just to extend that process to check, not only for whether the world will be destroyed by being turned into strange matter, but whether an experiment might bring about time travel. I get that that danger might seem speculative and outlandish, but so too is combusting all oxygen in the atmosphere or reducing the Earth down to the size of a football stadium. It can only be in our interests to check. So it's, it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't run any of these high energy, thoughts, uh, high energy experiments for fear of bringing about time travel, but just that we should police learning them with one more danger in mind. So that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this talk. Even if you've not become convinced about changing the details of CERN's safety procedures, I hope you've learned more about metaphysics and the philosophy of time travel. Thank you.